All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. This is episode number 17. I'm here with Dr. Austin Baraki. I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. What's going on, Austin? Doing great. How are you? I I am fine. Yeah, you know, it's, it's meat <laughs> well, week. I, 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 yeah, it's meat week. It's That's meat why. week for you. Yeah, you're great. So everything feels about 200 pounds lighter than it is. So well, weight good. weight isn't even real. It's like a perception of your. It's kind of like right. pain, also yeah, like all. backs, <laughs> knees. It's really a projection of your cingulate gyrus and your amygdala, yes. and you, whatever so, perception your weight, your brain decides to output to your body is how it feels to you. Right, right. Which is influenced. And then by you choose. You then choose to interpret that as either feeling good, in which case you are more likely to continue doing that task, or feeling not good. You choose. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Perhaps just a, a program that is running in your brain is, is you know, coming to the forefront. Um, in any event, well, that's good. So uh, just a brief aside about your meat prep. So this is your first meet in like, what, a decade now? What's the... <laughs> uh, since a uh, little over two years, because uh, residency had me tied up for a little bit there, uh, as well as some other kind of lingering issues that came up along the way, but worked through most of them. Um, basically at the beginning of the year on January, February timeframe, I came down with a nasty case of quad tendinopathy on the left, managed to rehab that by the mid to late spring. So that was fixed by about April, maybe or so early May. Uh, and then, so then I actually started training more, uh, you know, proper and got my strength back up. And so it, the timing has worked out pretty well. Cause now I'm basically at, I'm probably, I'm definitely the strongest I've ever been on the squat. Um, I've had a lingering elbow issue, so I'm not anywhere near PR strength levels on the bench, but I'm just going to kind of do it anyway in this meet. And the deadlift is feeling pretty good too. So I'm just mainly excited to get back on the platform and put up some numbers, have some fun and um, get myself kind of back into the game from that standpoint. And then probably look to another meet maybe in the spring sometime. And he's back in the game just like that. Yes. Well, I'm going to retire. No, I'm well, just kidding. No, perfect, I, perfect timing. Perfect timing. Yeah, it's actually only one of us can be strong at a time. So it's, <laughs> a, it's actually fun. <clears throat> yeah, so and I have a meet coming up in October. So I'm like four weeks out from that. Mm -hmm. Leah's two weeks out from nationals. So we're all walking the walk, right? I guess. Faking it. Um, <laughs> in any event, so this episode is going to be about calorie intake, body composition, and their... Uh, relationship with performance and aesthetics. What so, uh, what prompted this topic, doctor? Yeah, doctor, doctor. <laughs> yeah. So there was a, a post on the Facebook group, uh, and I'll read it in its entirety. So Austin Baraki and Jordan Feigenbaum are clearly seriously into training for strength. However, neither of them look like guys who are eating a significant calorie surplus to accelerate getting stronger. They both look pretty lean to me and both appear to have less than 15% body fat. I would like to ask if they could explain, one, how they are keeping the body fat off, two, what their calorie intake is in relation to their TDEE, which is total daily energy expenditure, three, reveal if they are doing any kind of conditioning, and if so, what? I hope this question is okay here. I know that starting strength is all about eating all the food and not doing any conditioning, but I'm thinking beyond the linear progression, which is often discussed here. If this is too much to answer in a post, in any detail, uh, because it requires a nuanced response, hashtag nuance, I'd be grateful if you guys could include it in a future Q&A or podcast. Well, here we are. Here we are. And I'd like to say this. Starting strength is not all about eating all of the food and not doing any conditioning. Starting strength at its core, and I feel like this is very important to put out on the internet, Starting strength at its core is about the analysis and performance of five major lifts, okay? So the squat, the press, the bench press, the deadlift, and the power clean. That is what starting strength is. It's a, it's a biomechanical analysis of those lifts, all right? And the starting strength novice linear progression is a program that is designed to maximize a novice lifter's return on investment for training, okay? That is what starting strength is. The models of the exercises give us a sort of uh, background to uh, uh, analyze our movement, to analyze our technique so that we get optimal results from our training efforts. Um, but it is not about, yo, bro, just gain a bunch of weight and get stronger. Yes, we want you to get stronger. Yes, if you're underweight, we want you to gain weight. All right. Uh, however, it should be clearly stated that the caricature of starting strength that is online is not what we do, uh, at least not what we do here. 
uh, you and I, and, and I would, I would say, you know, the 120 something or 130 something starting strength coaches that are active, <clears throat> we don't, uh, they don't do that either. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that everyone's, being, yeah, everyone's terrified that they're going to turn into a fat T-Rex looking dude or something like that, which is again, not consistent with the results that we get with our trainees that we put on the program and make them run it through. Right. And when we say the program and Austin does his scare quotes, if you'll please demonstrate the program, <laughs> Uh, we mean the starting strength novice linear progression. Okay. And again, to be 100% clear, the novice linear progression is a program that's ran in a finite period of time, usually between three to five months before significant modification is required. And then after that, you'll be doing different programming and potentially chasing down different goals than just getting stronger. Not that Mm -hmm. getting stronger is not a admirable goal. I mean, I think you and I are both still chasing that dragon. So yeah, Okay, so we kind of threw together a little outline. We're going to freestyle here as well, but uh, I'll pose some questions, try to get into some nuance. We'll try to make this very useful for you at home. All right, Austin, if you had to tell us what your calorie intake is on a daily basis, could you do so with any precision? No. No. However, however, (laughs) you do use certain techniques that would otherwise make your calorie intake appropriate for your goals and right. consistent. Um, so what do you do to that sort of that likely corrects for not sure. tracking your calories? Yeah. So this is something that we talk about with a lot of people in various situations, whether they're in a fat loss situation in a weight gain situation, kind of whatever the goal body composition or total body mass goal is uh, that the people who tend to have the most success are the people who have some method of continuous or regular self-monitoring um, that allows them to kind of make little course adjustments for slight deviations from the from the track that they're trying to stick to. If you only ever monitor your progress once every six months, then you're going to wait six months before you realize, hey, things aren't going the direction I want them to go in. Whereas if you have more regular self-monitoring, you can detect little deviations um, and you can detect them consistently, uh, reliably, and you can detect when it's more than just a little error bar fluctuation um, and, and kind of correct for them in real time. So there's theoretically a bunch of different ways that you could do that. My personal choice is just to weigh myself pretty often. I tend to weigh myself almost every morning. Uh, most evenings, uh, and that actually tends to uh, give me a good idea as to where my weight is on a very regular basis. And it lets me know, um, you know, like if I have gone through what I perceive to be a normal day of eating and I go to bed at night and I know that I'm going to swing, say, three pounds overnight of just whatever water weight or something, wake up, I tend to wake up about three pounds lighter than I went to sleep. Um, And I know that, you know, say I want to weigh 200 pounds on the dot and I go to sleep and I'm weighing 200 pounds at bedtime, I know I under ate significantly that day. So I'm going to probably go back downstairs and eat some more and I'm going to try to compensate for it the next day by eating a little more than usual to get myself kind of back on track. Um, And if I'm kind of overdoing it, if I'm going to bed and I'm like, 204 205 which has actually never happened uh, but if that did happen then uh, that would be apparent to me that i'm maybe being a little bit aggressive because at this point in our training progression i'm not in a situation where i'm trying to gain two three pounds a week or something like that um, and so i'll correct for it probably over the next day or two days and kind of just keep things kind of steadily going up which is the way they've been steadily going for the past several years at this point <clears throat> but uh, and i think it's important to to say you uh, explicitly mentioned that you are not trying to rapidly gain weight. Correct. Uh, why is that the case? So at this point in my training progression, as compared to uh, one of our novice trainees who is grossly underweight, which we'll talk about the specifics of kind of what that means in a little bit. But in that situation, uh, the aggressive weight gain is actually to get them more so than even to get them uh, recovering from session to session. It's just to get them to a baseline level of body mass, body fat, kind of their hormonal milieu, all these other things we talk about to the point where they can sustain this training over a longer period of time. Because that's the typical scenario we see is somebody who re- is and remains too underweight. They're not with progression. They'll fail on like week two. And then like the program didn't work for me. So we're trying to get them into a situation where they can have sustainable long-term process progress. At this point I've made, a very long term, very, a large amount of long term progress. And I'm making progress at a reasonable rate for me at my level of advancement right now. And then 
at this point, once I'm once you're past the novice phase, as you mentioned earlier, whether you have other goals outside of strength, for example, you have to consider some other things. And we always ask people when they ask us, how much weight should I gain? And then we say, well, how good or how strong do you want to be? So I'm for my height, which is the same as your height or essentially the same height, you know, we would have to weigh, as we typically say, we probably have to fill out of the 120s or something like that to be, to be, you know, reasonably competitive. And at this point, we're just not interested in doing that. Um, and so facilitating further progress through gradual weight gain is a reasonable way to keep body fat in check, as uh, this question asker uh, alluded to, uh, versus very, very aggressive weight gain for us at this point. Yeah. When it does not comport with our goals. Yeah, so I think that's important, and you know, it bears sort of repeating and, and to make it very clear. Um, when you are no longer a novice, your rate of adaptation is slower by definition. So you cannot adapt and express that adaptation from workout to workout. It's week to week, and if you're an advanced lifter like Austin and I, then it's even longer than that. So that means that the adaptations, such as even muscle gain, or uh you know are going to take longer and mm -hmm. going to be less robust than they were previously because we've already made a lot of the rapid progress already so gaining weight rapidly doesn't really serve the same purpose for us even if we'd be stronger being heavier mm -hmm. um it would just be less less productive um also we're not grossly underweight you know if you were 180 i think you could make a case that your progress would be much faster if you gained a bunch of weight right now. Sure. Um, the more nuanced uh, discussion would be <laughs> if you said, you know what, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and I'm going to go from 200 pounds to 275. <laughs> and my plan is to do that in the next three months. Would <laughs> your training produce a rapid improvement in strength? And I think the answer to that is likely yes, but you are not willing to make that compromise. Mm -hmm. And that is not to suggest that our goal sets are, you know, should be adopted by everyone, but just where we're at in our lives and the other things that we do and our personal preferences and our conditioning. And I don't mean and that. And, 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 and also recognizing the uh, kind of the, the effects that that might have on uh, doctor patient relationships. Sure. If it's, they, it's just complicated. If they come to see you and you're, you know, huge, rotund, uh, plethoric, mouth breathing, apneic, <laughs> things like that, <laughs> does not really inspire the picture of health to your patients that we're preaching this stuff to. So. Sure. So, so multiple complicated games being played here. Um, you know, this is not just a, a single a single thing going on. It's a lot of, a lot of stuff. And I think ultimately we've just decided either subconsciously or, or very publicly like, yeah, we'd be stronger at 275, not willing to make those sacrifices, which yeah. is why we'll never be world champions, you know, in addition to other things. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I think ultimately when you say, well, why don't you guys gain weight? You know, the curse is that we've kind of gotten pretty strong at our given body weights, and that's okay mm -hmm. for us. We've kind of like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm okay yeah. with chasing down these five and ten pound PRs. Um, I have no aspirations of being a world champion. I would like to fit into a large or XL, and I would like to be able to be a public sort of representation of mm -hmm. health. Um, you know, insofar as I can do that. So it's kind of like it's kind of like a lot of other training type decisions that uh, people ask us for our advice on. And sometimes the answer comes down to, uh, you know, either personal preference or it comes down to like by the time you have achieved or attained this level of performance, you'll be uh, experienced yeah, enough, you'll be better equipped enough to be able to to make these decisions for yourself yeah, rather yeah, than listening yeah, to some yeah. other guy. Yeah. But it, so let's let's give a TLDR for this calorie intake thing. If you are a novice and you are underweight, which the definition is going to be, you know, pretty broad as for what constitutes underweight. Uh, but but let's let's use our imagination here. For instance, if you're a male and you're somewhere between, you know, 5'7 and 5'10 and you weigh significantly less than 180, 190 pounds, you're underweight. It doesn't mean you're gross. You know, you're not cachectic. 
<laughs> right. So, so we have to we have to differentiate, you know, between somebody calling somebody like clinically underweight versus underweight for a particular outcome. Sure. And the outcome here being the strength that we're looking for. You know, right? and, and it may be useful to give the you know, there's in obesity, there's grade one, grade two, grade three. Yeah. So, you know, we could kind of pioneer this from a strength training perspective. So uh, underweight on a strength training scale. If, you know, for a five foot 10 male, uh, if you are 10% uh, under 200 pounds, so you're 180 pounds, you're grade one underweight. <laughs> grade one gains opinion. Gains opinion. Yeah, sure. And if you're 20%, <laughs> so this means you're in that 160 range, you're grade two. Things are very serious here. You need to gain weight, please. And if you're 30% under. All 140 right. at what height? Sorry. Yeah. Five foot 10. You yeah, are grade three. Good. This is severe gainsopenia. <laughs> you, you know, you need to gain weight like yesterday. And yeah. those three, you know, cohorts will need will have different rate of gain. So, for instance, the person who's 150 at five foot ten may in fact gain four to five pounds per week on their mm-hmm. novice LP for the first six weeks or so to get their body weight up to something reasonable. And then it might tight, you know, got, go down to four pounds a week or three pounds a week as they, you know, kind of run out their LP and they end up at two ten, something mm-hmm. like that, you know? Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Now, conversely, if you're five ten, two you you're not underweight. So guess what you don't need to do during your LP? Go mad aggressively gain weight. Yeah. And the only reason to do go mad is if that's the only way that you can maintain your weight or slowly increase your weight. Cause I would say even for a guy who's five ten, two hundred 200 pounds, um, that they would see a significant performance benefit if they are a novice by running the novice linear progression by slowly gaining weight. And I'm talking about a pound sure. a week. All yeah. right. <clears throat> now that probably goes out the window when somebody's 220 or heavier. So this would be <laughs> grade one, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, hyper gains. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I'm just saying that there's no indication for somebody who's 220 right. and 5 foot 10 to gain weight. If there's, yes. if somebody's 240 and 5 10, they need to probably lose weight while, on the, while they're on the LP, you know, and uh, certainly if they're 240 and 5 10, then they would definitely lose weight whilst on the LP. So oh, yeah, this is this is to be clear. Talking about obviously untrained individuals yes. who are starting the novice program, not somebody that you look at who's a two forty two competitive powerlifter at five ten and sure. is really strong. We're not telling them they need to lose weight. So. No, no, right. But they're not on the novice LP either, so exactly. already out of context. And yeah. the I'm just anticipating these things. Even. Sure, yeah, the YouTube <laughs> comments are going to go crazy. So don't worry, we'll get that gain scale out to you guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a nice infographic for Austin because he loves infographics so much. <laughs> Um, you know, and then one thing that probably we should address here is female, the XX female who is, you know, cause we're going to get a question. Well, what about women, you know, yeah. and certainly just due to the demographics we see in pure strength and conditioning, we, there's just less data and less anecdotal or, uh, or less professional experience with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, it depends on the female as far as the rate of weight gain. And I think I've said this on another one of our Q and A's, potentially one of our podcasts. Cause I, as I kind of refine this a little bit further and further that athletic, so we'll just call it the athletic phenotype. Mm-hmm. So phenotype is the expression of someone's genetics of their genotype. It's the physical manifestation of their genes and all the environmental factors that go into expressing these traits. So the athletic phenotype on the far end where they're super athletic, super developed, a lot of lean body mass, narrow hips, broad shoulders, very robust response to training, uh, a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers, uh, uh, very good motor learning systems. They pick up things very quickly, Um, higher testosterone levels. They get a more robust muscle protein synthesis response when they eat uh, protein rich meals. Okay. On the other end of the scale, is the more classically feminine, you know, when we think about all the stereotypes that people are going to give us, you know, trouble about, we're talking wider hips, narrower shoulders, less lean body mass, lower testosterone, less robust response to training, um, all these things. So depending on where a person falls on that scale is also going to influence the recommended rate of weight gain, you know, in addition to the context of how much they actually weigh at the, at that time. Yeah. So if you have a very athletic female, she's very far on the right side, 
but she is very underweight, you can be more aggressive with their weight gain if you can, you know, if, if that's something that they're willing to undertake. On the other hand, you could have a very underweight female who is on that left end, the very unathletic. And that doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means that it would be inappropriate to recommend a very aggressive weight gain because they're going to end up with a lot more body fat than lean body mass mm-hmm. per, per amount of weight gain. They will not be happy with you. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, like, again, a lot of this is going to come down to personal preference and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the, the coaching I hear is very important as well. So if, if you have uh, somebody who is, um, you know, just ignoring the metrics that you sh- we should be tracking here. So you track mm-hmm. your weight on a very regular basis. That's what you use. Um, I use weight. I use waist measurements with women. I use waist and hip measurements. Mm-hmm. Those would tend to be the things that I track. If you're not paying attention to those, Um, and making management decisions on intake based on that, in addition to objective performance in the gym, um, I think you're missing the boat. You just don't have, you don't have enough tools in your, in your toolbox to kind of manage this appropriately. And all of it needs to be, as we mentioned, the context here, uh, I feel like needs to be made clear to the, to the trainee in terms of thinking about this as an intervention that we're doing, uh, doing to them sort of that there needs to be some amount of kind of like an informed consent type thing where they understand that (laughs) if we are recommending that you gain weight here, uh, it should be your understanding that this weight gain is being undertaken to facilitate what we're doing in the gym, for example, to get you from this quote unquote underweight category to a normal weight category. And if you're, you know, to, you know, if you're willing to undertake this process, this is what you can expect to result from it. If you're not interested in those results, then you might not be interested in this process of weight gain, for example. So it kind of has to be, all this has to be made clear to them when you undertake this process. I like that. I like that. Uh, okay. Let's move on. Body fat. Austin, if you had to estimate your body fat now, what, uh, what are you working with over there? You never, you never take your shirt off, honey. You, you know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe right around fifteen. I don't know. That's a guess. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Somewhere in that fifteen, you know, fourteen to seventeen ish range, and I would probably settle at fifteen, and that's fine. And I would probably say the same for me. Um, if I had to guess, uh, I think that. So first, people always ask, you know, is it worthwhile to track body fat and I actually don't think so. And, and here's why. 99.5% of people who are tracking their body fat are doing so just from an aesthetic standpoint. Okay? Mm-hmm. So how do I look? Which is measured subjectively in the mirror. Really, you're looking, you're using pictures or, you know, how, how you feel you look based on, on that as a subjective sure. indicator of how your body fat's trending. Objectively, you can use your waist and hip measurement if, uh, if needed to see, you know, yeah, am I gaining a bunch of weight just around my abdomen or not? And adding another objective piece of information, which is body fat testing, which has a lot of irregularities and artifact, mm-hmm. so just, you know, problems with the test itself. In sure. addition to there being a relatively high cost for body fat analysis, um, you know, particularly for accurate ones, so DEXA or hydrostatic weighing, uh, for instance, I don't think it adds anything to the equation that's helpful. I mean, in terms, the, of, in terms of management. In terms of management, yeah. So, so for instance, I worked with this this gal for like three years, um, and her DEX she got she would get DEXAs uh, periodically that that just she wanted to do it, and so effectively, when someone says. Yeah, I just want to, I have access to this stuff and I just want to do it for my own, you know, motivation and stuff. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. that's fine, but I will never push it. But in any event, I'll, let me just tell you how ridiculous this is. The DEXA suggested that she lost 6% body fat and gained 8 kilos of muscle mass <laughs> over the course of our, over the course of our time together, which, seems uh, unlikely. seems unlikely. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, there's error in the tests, And if it doesn't ultimately change your management outside of the other information that you already have, then why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. That's my, that's my takeaway. But you know, if you have free access to the stuff and it's going to keep you motivated and it's just another piece of uh, objective information, you don't weight too heavily. And you know, when you have waist and hip measurements and, um, and then the subjective interpretation of your own pictures, then I think, you know, it's a waste. Um, to be honest. Now, as far as is there a healthy body fat versus an unhealthy body fat, I think at that point you have to discuss visceral adipose tissue. So, so, so ab, you know, fat 
uh, stored mostly in the abdominal region to mm-hmm. uh, compared to peripheral uh, adipose tissue, which we just call subcutaneous adipose tissue. So it's under the skin. It's not concentrated in the abdomen. It tends to be less hormonally active uh, from a, 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 a negative health consequence standpoint. And depending on your ethnicity and uh, background, there are certain cutoff points that are well established as far as where you have increased risk of things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and insulin resistance and all that stuff. In the United States, for people of Eastern Europe, uh, for people of like European descent or just Caucasian folks in general, um, if you're a male and your waist around the belly button is over 40 inches. And if you're a female, it's over 35 inches. And I believe for Asian, uh, people of Asian descent, it's 33 for females and 37 for males, although it's unofficial cutoff. Um, that Those represent high amounts of abdominal adipose tissue, which, uh, you know, would be a reason to not gain weight aggressively. You know, if a guy comes to you and he's five foot 10 and 180 pounds and he's got a 40 inch waist... <laughs> Well, I'm just saying it's possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At that point, you're like, you know, I do think that your strength progress would be better served by gaining weight. However, you already have a risk factor for having a poor outcome with weight gain. And by poor outcome, we mean a bunch of body fat gained, less lean body mass added, and, you know, uh, metabolic complications like diabetes, cardiovascular disease risk increase if your waist goes up, which it likely will when gaining weight. It almost certainly will in that type of situation. And this is something that's super common is that there's a lot of skepticism in our community and the strength, uh, you know, barbell training community about kind of what a healthy body weight is, uh, especially when it comes to things like the BMI scale. They say like, it's like, as soon as you, people (laughs) seem to think that like, as soon as you pick up the barbell for the first time, the BMI no longer applies to you, for example, right? uh, which is not true for most, for most people who are not profoundly muscled. Yeah. Uh, And then, and then, you know, they, they kind of minimize the adverse health consequences of aggressive weight gain when they're already in an, in an overweight uh, situation. So somebody who has a 40 inch waist, but they're starting out the novice program, they're like, I want to get my squad to 315 because 315 is my marker of health, independent of what my waist measurement is. So their waist measurement goes to 45, their lipid panel goes crazy. They have all kinds of other consequences from it, but they kind of rationalize it to themselves by saying, Oh, I train. So none of that stuff applies to me. Right. So I've had to counsel a few people against this type of situation who might, might have a horrible looking, you know, they, they, might, they might have horrible looking lipid panel. They might have a huge uh, waist measurement. They might be very obviously, uh, obese, uh, have elevated amounts of visceral adipose tissue just by looking at them. And they're like, well, how much weight should I gain on my novice progression? And I'm just like, that would not be an intelligent decision. I understand your goal is to get really strong, but my goal is to get you strong and for you to not die in the process to be healthy. (laughs) Right. right. And I think at that point, you know, so we do have good data that um, just resistance training in and of itself without weight loss will cause a reduction of visceral adipose tissue. So abdominal fat, your waist measurement will go down even if you don't lose weight. And so in this situation, if I've got a guy comes to me with a 41 inch waist, or if I got a female comes to me with a 36 inch waist, for instance, um, I'm not going to have them gain weight, but I'm not going to have them lose weight unless there's another reason to, uh, for instance, a fasting blood sugar of like 126 or higher, um, known diabetes or no, sure. their, their, their lipid panel is actually really, really bad. And at that point, their existing risk factors for health uh, problems outweighs their deep, their, their, you know, level of being detrained, you know? Right. So, so I know I'm going to make their, them stronger and I know it's going to be slowed with, I don't have them gain weight. It's going to be even a little slower when they lose weight, but because they've already declared themselves a sort of risky patient uh, for weight gain, I think I need to take care mm-hmm. of that first. Um, yeah. but if I have somebody with just a increased waist size and no other signs of like, you know, this deranged sort of uh, metabolic arrangement, then, um, <clears throat> I'll just have them train, maintain their weight, see their waist go down. Uh, which brings up well, one second before I, oh, the, thing, the, the, thing, the thing I want to get across here is that because there's going to be people who are going to say, but what about the idea of just get as strong as possible, milk every ounce that you can out of the LP and then deal with all that stuff later. And that's kind of the counter argument to this, to this that I can anticipate us getting. So what I would say to somebody, something like that is that let's think about kind of what you have to do to facilitate milking every last ounce out of the novice linear progression. And in this type of situation, how overrated that is relative to the consequences that you have going on. And that's where you mentioned that, uh, 
the high baseline risk from a health standpoint of that individual is not outweighed by, say, putting 25 more pounds on your squat by the end of your novice linear progression relative to stalling out a little sooner because you weren't as aggressive with your weight gain. We're kind of making the argument that it's okay that you might not get quite as far on your novice linear progression in the context of someone who has lots of cardiometabolic risk factors, who is just already baseline pretty unhealthy person. We're saying from our perspective, that's an okay trade-off. Yep. Yep, exactly. It, the uh, effect, the juice isn't worth the squeeze uh, to get your squat up to 365 uh, compared to 275. If at the 275 we get a reduced waist, your cholesterol panel improves and your fasting blood sugar improves. And yeah, you know, if your goal is to be a world champion power lifter, but you already have a 41 inch waist and your cholesterol panel is bad and you're, you know, have an elevated fasting blood sugar. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be the one to tell you that I don't think it's going to work out for you um, yeah. unless you're 75 and you're the only person in your weight class. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't want to be too smug about this, but I think that's important to realize that in general, the people who are going to be world beaters, all right, from a strength sport perspective, do not have these health problems that they're dealing with, all right? And just like they're resistant to injury, just like they respond better than normal to training, just like they, you know, have a bunch of extrinsic and intrinsic motivation that maybe not everyone yeah. else has, just like they might be in a socioeconomic class that allows them to train, you know, like, yes, sports are unfair. Lots of, lots of selection factors there for sure. Okay. Lightning round. We're going to both answer these questions. Number one, are you more of a hunter or a gatherer? I don't know what that means. Uh, I suppose I gather meat from the grocery store. <laughs> uh, I would agree that I'm more of a gatherer. I think I fired a weapon a handful of times. I know that's going to disappoint all my friends and yeah. my family. I'm a disgrace. I am sorry. Sorry, guys. Austin, you're a new addition to the crayon box. What color would you be and why? Ooh. Oh, man. I'm not this creative. Shit. Austin's very left brained. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say green because I like green. I drew the duck blue because I've never seen a blue (laughs) duck. Uh, I think I'm going to be plaid because I think I own (laughs) copious amounts of plaid. Um, We finish this podcast and you step outside and you find a lottery ticket that ends up winning $10 million. What do you do? Um, Well, I probably will... I'm trying to think if I would actually leave my job on the spot or not. Um, but soup up, sweet home gym, start blowing up this barbell medicine operation worldwide. Prestige worldwide. Prestige worldwide. Prestige worldwide. <laughs> so I think if I uh, came into $10 million, I would start my own medical school. That is an interesting idea. Yeah. Well, the barbell medicine school. So the idea well, is we'd lower, you, we would take more people. It'd be like law school. Like everyone can get in, but then you have to work to stay in. And then uh, there would definitely be an extra uh, training course that goes on throughout. Physical health of the actual students and employees would be a high priority. Um, there'd be formal nutrition training. There'd be a lot more psych- uh, psychology training for motivational interviewing outside of the standard patient interview. Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I like being busy. All right. What do you think about when you're alone in the car? Where are these questions coming from? <laughs> that's not, that's not, that's you're, you don't get to ask me questions. Uh, so I'm never alone silent in the car. There's always something playing. And so in San Antonio, driving around here to work and back, it's either going to be some sort of a podcast, in which case I'm just listening to the podcast, or it's going to be some sort of radio thing, or I'm thinking like if I'm driving home from work, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do in training that day. That's usually the main things. Um, what I'm thinking about is usually what my next also text is going to be. <laughs> you have to explain context. To yeah. People. So whenever I text Austin also, it's mainly, uh, Hey, here's some harebrained idea. New project, new idea. project. Yeah. It's going to keep us really busy. We have, we have time for these things. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. What is your favorite nineties jam? Um, well, my all time favorite artist is Biggie Smalls, 90s rapper. I'm going to assume that Hypnotize came out in the 90s, and that's favorite song. Fair enough. There we go. 
Uh, being from the Midwest and growing up on grunge and alternative sort of, yeah, music. I didn't give a typical nineties type song. I just said something from the night. Yeah. From the night. That's fine. Uh, it would have to be, uh, black by Pearl jam. I know people just got real upset. Okay. Thanks for joining us for barbell medicine podcast. Episode number 17. That was part one of the body fat calorie and weight gain episode. Part two will be up next Wednesday. So make sure to tune in for that. You can head over to barbellmedicine.com for more media. We have a forum up. You can click on the forum link, register, ask us questions. Um, also to note, Amazon Prime is now shipping the Gains RX, and you can check that out over on Amazon.com. All right, thanks for listening. See you guys next time.